Good morning, and welcome to today's mission status briefing. With us today is uh, Jerry Jason, the International Space Station Flight Control uh, Director, who's just coming off his orbit one shift. Jerry? Thank you very much. Uh, to start out the briefing today, i just kind of like to give you a little bit of status of uh, how things are going on board today. Uh, we've had a very successful day on orbit. Uh, the crew successfully installed the MPLM uh, in a Node 2 Nader port. Uh, the crew is running approximately an hour ahead of schedule when I left, so everything's going really, really well. We only had one minor uh, glitch during the entire birthing process. We had a micro switch on one of the payload bay perlas, which is a payload retention latch. Uh, failed to indicate that the perla was open, but we have a second micro switch that gave us the indication was open. We can also monitor the uh, currents of the motors and everything uh, indicated that it was open. So it had no impact to the timeline and we got through the berthing uh, pretty much in a nominal fashion. Crew's doing great. Uh, they're in a good mood. Both the station and uh, the shuttle crews are doing great. And the ground team is in a very good mood and, and spirits are pretty high because we're having such a successful mission. So. I also wanted to cover a couple things that are probably talked about the last couple of days. One is in regards to the uh, orbital debris that we are tracking. Uh, we've gotten some updates since the uh, docking yesterday, and everything indicates that the debris is going to be well clear of station. The latest total missed distance was around 18 kilometers, which is well outside our action block. Um, so we're not going to take any um, action to move out of the way of this orbital debris. And it should clear us tomorrow with no issue at all. Uh, secondly, um, we had a GPC-3 uh, issue on the shuttle. Uh, today, the crew successfully reloaded um, that GPC, and it is currently operational and is ready for use uh, for when we undock and do the entry uh, later, this, in, later this week. Um, additionally, um, we're doing well on the cryo margins on board the shuttle. Um, things are looking good for an extension day, although that official decision will be made by the mission management team probably tomorrow or the uh, next day. Thank you, Jerry. We'll take uh, questions now. We'll start here in Houston. Uh, please uh, wait for the microphone, and please remember to tell us your name and your affiliation. Dan Vergano with USA Today. Could you say a little bit more about what the crew is going to be doing today? Uh, it's more than just schlepping bags around, I see. Um, the, the crew will be busy basically preparing the MPLM. Um, when I went off console today, they were basically uh, leak checking uh, the port that we docked to, the MPLM to, or excuse me, birthed the MPLM to. So they're, and then they're going to go ahead and do that outfitting. We go ahead and we um, open up the hatches and we, we do an environment check, uh, make sure that the air is good in there and, um, and before we actually allow the crew to go in and access it. So um, the rest of the day, the, the crew is going to be getting ready for the EVA tomorrow. We have our EVA tomorrow. Um, so they've been doing their prep work to make sure the suits are ready to go, uh, reviewing their procedures, um, and uh, doing their general prep work for the EVA. So uh, besides getting the MPL ready to go, it's mostly working on the EVA. Gina? Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. How many of the crew members will be involved in the transfers? Uh, I mean, is this an all-hands-on-deck issue, except when you're doing a spacewalk or anything else? Basically, um, all the crew members um, at some point are going to be helping us do the uh, transfer of the uh, transfer and the, the pack of the MPLM uh, during the next couple of days. Uh, it is pretty much an all hands on, on deck. Uh, we have about 10,000 pounds of cargo that we need to move out of the MPLM, and then we have to move all the items that we're returning uh, back into the MPLM before we unberth it here in the next couple of days. So it's going to be a very busy uh, time period for it, and that's what this mission's for. It's, it's a utilization logistics mission, and we want to make sure we get all that cargo out of there. Irene? Um, Irene Klotz with Reuters. Um, what is the plan for the uh, shuttle's docking node on the station after Atlantis leaves? Oh, you're referring to the, the PMA? The PMA-3. Yeah. Uh, um, the PMA-3 is designed for the orbiter docking system. So after that, we're essentially just going to, um, we're not going to be docking to it anymore because we don't have a, a compatible docking mechanism for any of our other visiting vehicles. So uh, we're going to take it and we're going to use it for storage. And we're gonna, um, that's one of the main uh, challenges we have right, on, right now because we're bringing up all this cargo 
and all the other cargo vehicles had recently visited. Um, we need places to put things, so we're going to be putting some equipment in there that can uh, be taken down um, to lower temperatures that the PMA environment would see. So it's going to be used for stowage. There, there's no plans to uh, attach anything else to it that could be used for another vehicle at any point? Not at, not at this time. The, the uh, APDS um, or the ODS, the orbiter docking system, isn't compatible with uh, any other docking system, whether it's a Soyuz, Progress, ATV, HTV. Um, and my understanding is neither neither the Cygnus or the orbital vehicles will dock to that. Thanks. And on, just a real quick, is it correct to call what you did with GPC-3 a reboot? Um, we, we call it an IPL, which is an initial program load, but we're basically uh, taking the software that resides what's called on the mass memory unit, which would be like a hard drive, and taking that information and reloading it. So it's, it's more like a reload okay, than thanks. a reboot. And uh, the last question I had is, um, uh, before every shuttle launch, um, there's a risk assessment for orbital debris for shuttle. Do you have that for station as well? And has that, um, what, is it, what is it currently? I think, the, let me make sure that I understand the question you're asking, if, if we're overall, do we do a risk assessment for the, the total debris in there? No, 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 no. The, uh, for shuttle, there's a risk of a uh, you know, catastrophic failure due to debris impact, mm -hmm. orbital debris impact. It's like 300 and something. I don't know what it is exactly, yeah. permission, but I was just curious if there is a similar risk assessment for overall probability of um, station risk. I know we do uh, risk assessments, and we're constantly reevaluating that. And we do the risk assessments uh, continuously as the orbital debris environment changes. I do not have the number right now, but I'll work to get you that number and find out what it is for station. But I know it's, it's a variable number based on how the environment changes. Thank you. Okay, yes. Denise Chow at space.com. Um, earlier, I think it was said that uh, when Atlantis docked at the station, it may have helped boost um, the station out of the way of this orbital debris. Could you explain a bit about how that works? Um, actually, I think it was the, the other way around. I think the original concern was that um, because of the way that we were docking would actually push us a little bit closer to the, um, to the debris. So obviously, when you, you take, a, take the station and it's holding uh, a uh, certain attitude, certain orbit, and you, you take um, the shuttle, which is a very big object, and kind of bump it into it, it's going to give it a, a change in the, the delta velocity a little bit, which impacts our overall del altitude. So after um, we had a couple orbits after docking to evaluate essentially our new trajectory, we, we compared it to the orbital debris directory and make sure that we were, we were cleared. So did I answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Do we have additional questions here in Houston? Uh, yes, Dan. Just to follow up on that, um, do you have an idea how big the delta V was from that, and is it the actual bumping that's doing it, or is it changing the center of the mass somehow adjusts the trajectory of you know, yeah. the combined station and shuttle? In my understanding, it's the, it's the the you're actually correct. It's actually both. We actually do change the CG of it because you're putting the. Uh, order on the end of it, and uh, as far as the actual Delta V, I'd have to go ask my, my specialist that question, but I, I don't answer that, but I think it's a combination of both. Gina? Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. Are you going to keep the space station at this high in orbit, I mean, long term? Yeah, that, that, that's the goal, is to keep it at about that, uh, that 300 range. Would you explain that a little bit for me? Um, there is a, it, it all goes into the evaluation of the vehicles that we're going to have visiting in, in the future and what's the optimal altitude for those rendezvous to, to um, uh, work out. So we have progresses, we have Soyuz, and as I mentioned, ATV, HTVs. So the, the program made an assessment on which orbits we wanted to fly. And when you add a little bit of a higher altitude, you have a little bit of uh, lesser drag on the vehicle as well. So if we get up a little bit higher, uh, means that we have to do uh, less frequent reboosts. So if you're at a lower altitude, you're always dragging a little bit more, so we always have to kind of bump the attitude a little bit. So balance with all our vehicle traffic and trying to save um, our reboost or our, our propulsion prop, um, that was the altitude that the program decided to go at. Okay, and anything else here in Houston? Uh, seeing no further questions here, we'll go to Kennedy Space Center. 
Hello, this is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press with a few questions. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the net effect of the docking yesterday actually bumped the uh, whole, both spacecraft up just a tad, is that correct? It uh, changed our, I can't say if it went up or down, but it, it did change our orbit enough that um, it, it did not become a concern for the debris. So taking a look at our new trajectory versus where the uh, object's trajectory was and when we crossed paths with it, it's, it's no longer a concern. Uh, the total missed distance, as I mentioned before, is around uh, 18 kilometers, so it's well outside our action box. Thank you, and um, when, it, when it comes time to start unloading the MPLM this afternoon, uh, how, how are they going to decide what comes out first? Is it high priority items first? Is it the uh, the containers closest to the hatch that come out, out first, um, or maybe in the back? Could you explain that a little, please? Um, actually, it's a it's a very choreographed um, um, show that we do there. Um, in regards to the unpacking, uh, we have what is called a transfer list. Um, it's not only high priority items, but what's in front first, but also where we're going to be putting the items in station. Uh, so we actually may pull items out of the front of the MPLM, attempt stow it in the location to get to some higher priority items, and then later on go back and get those items that we temp stowed in locations and put them in various locations throughout. So it's actually a very uh, well planned out choreographed, and we have uh, folks that specialize just in this transfer operation. And, and could you run down a couple of the high priority items? What are the first things that you'd like to see out of the MPLM? I think some of the, the, the usually the, some of the higher priority items are actually uh, re regard to the crew, crew preference items. Uh, we like to make sure that we get those uh, first, especially if the crew's been uh, waiting them for them for a while. So we usually go after crew preference items first. I believe that was our last question from Kennedy. Um, we'll go down to the phone bridge. I believe we have uh, Todd Halverson on from Florida today. Yeah, Todd Halverson of uh, Florida Today with just a couple. I was wondering if you could uh, go over the uh, uh, most important content uh, in your judgment in the EVA tomorrow. And uh, why is this spacewalk important to the space station? And I have a follow. Okay, I think you had a couple questions there. Let me uh, give you my opinion what I think is the most important. I think the most important is getting the uh, pump module. Um, back into the payload bay to return it back uh, home so we can do the uh, uh, TT and E or the, the evaluation of why the pump module failed. As folks probably recall, back last year uh, in the July period, um, we had the pump module fail. That took down half the external cooling on station. So we've been, uh, we pulled that out. We've been uh, keeping it stored on the outside of station. We're going to take that, put it back in the payload bay, and return it. Um, getting that back and understanding what the cause of that failure is is going to help us in the long run. It may change how we operate the pumps on board, uh, and maybe there'll be some design changes in the end. Uh, but we need to understand exactly what I, why that pump module failed. So, um, in in my mind, and, and that's probably the most important portion of it as well. As for, in regards to um, why this EVA is important, I think that, as I mentioned, the, the pump module. Uh, getting that back is probably is, is critical as well, but we have some other stuff out there we need to do as well. Um, we're, we're running some uh, data lines to a, uh, a, a grapple fixture that will allow us to put um, some robotic arms in, in different locations, uh, a little bit closer on the Russian segment, so that's going to help us as well. Um, thanks. And, and could you say where uh, commercial cruise space taxis uh, will be docking when they eventually get to the space station? Would that be at PMA2 um, or uh, exactly where? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, my understanding for the, the visiting vehicles that are uh, birthing to the USOS segment are going to use a, a, a common birthing mechanism system. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the orbiter docking system, which it currently resides on PMA2, uh, the vehicles aren't going to be designed for that, um, that I'm aware of. Uh, so we'd be doing a, a capture and, and birthing operation very similar to what we do for HTV. And, and just a quick follow-up, could you say where they would be birthed? 
would be, it'd be very similar to where we do now. So it'd have to be an open port, uh, such as a Node 2 Nader or Node 2 Zena, someplace where we have a uh, common uh, berthing mechanism. Thanks, that's all for me, Ira. Thank you. Do we have additional follow-ups here in Houston? Seeing none, we'll uh, conclude today's briefing. You can follow activities of the International Space Station and the flight of Atlantis at uh, www.nasa.gov. Thank you for coming. Hi, I'm Dylan Hogan. I'm John Polkamp. I'm Bob Swain. And I'm Amanda Coots. We're the DPS flight control team on the final shuttle mission. And, and you're, you're watching, watching NASA, NASA TV. TV.